Good morning, church. It is good to be together both online and in person. I welcome you this morning as we continue in our time of worship and praise to God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. So as we come together, I want to remind you of a few things. If you're online, you are welcome to look at our website and to uh, look at our bulletin, our newsletter. If any of that to your home would be better via mail or direct email, we can do that as well. Let us know. But if you're in person as well, on the back of your bulletin is our calendar for this week. A couple things. Um, church council will be this Monday, tomorrow, at 7 o'clock. All are welcome and invited to that meeting. We, a whole, we didn't have much on the agenda last month. We had a whole lot on the agenda this month. So if you um, want to be a part of those conversations, we invite you to be there. Uh, you'll also note that on Tuesday is book club. This was a shift from last week to this week. So note that it's at 1030. Um, also note that it held in your prayers this week. Uh, the Revere family will be moving into their home with Habitat for Humanity here in Atlantic Highlands. Um, I will be there for the home dedication. But it is an exciting time to welcome new folks into our community. So we hold them in prayer as they make this journey. Uh, and you'll also see next Monday night on Halloween, we'll have our photo op again right outside the front doors of the sanctuary here. So if, you're tr if you have people trick-or-treating around here, tell them to stop by, get their picture taken, um, because we'll be here to greet them and give them a treat as well. Those are the announcements I want to call to your attention. I want to welcome us all here, especially those who may be worshiping with us for one of the first times. If we don't have your information, there is a card in the pews. Please let us know you're here so that we can continue to just greet you. We will not bombard you, but we would love to greet you. Uh, so we invite you to do that. Those are the announcements I have. I know we have prayers in our midst. One of them being we hold Julie in our prayer. She had taken a fall. She's recuperating back at home. But we hold Julie in our prayers. Are there others who you would like to be praying for in this time? Grace. Yep. First, my husband, Charlie, he had a replacement surgery, so he's, he's passed his third week for the rough journey. So I have my prayers for you. Absolutely. We keep Charlie and we keep you in prayer, Grace, as you continue to help uh, him in his journey of healing and recuperation. Thank you. You're welcome. Others. When we come together, one of our gifts is to show God's presence to one another and to remind us that God is always, always in our midst. So I'm going to invite you to stand and greet one another with signs of peace and love, and we offer peace and love to all those worshiping with us online. Peace be with you. Let us come together as we uh, begin our time with praise to God.
How about we do the invitation to worship together? We'll do it responsively. Here, we reflect on the marvelous grace of our loving Lord, the grace and forgiveness that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Forgiveness is mercy. Such pardon and kindness we cannot fathom. Forgiveness is unfailing love. Such patience and understanding we comprehend. Forgiveness is overwhelming compassion. Such sympathy and warmth we cannot locate. Forgiveness is the blotting out of transgressions. Such freedom and goodwill we do not deserve. Forgiveness is the cleansing of our iniquities. Such purity and news we cannot maintain. Forgiveness is God's grace. May our mouths declare our praise. And now our song of praise is grace greater than our son than our sin. seated. Let us now all join together in our centering prayer. God of grace, too often we forget the new life that you would have us embrace. We let ourselves become depleted by the world, neglecting the stillness and silence that draws us back to ourselves and our relationship with you. You know that we carry within us those things we need to forgive ourselves and those things in our relationships with others we need to forgive. These memories of past struggles can often feel like they drag us down, yet we are unable to let them go. Help us to release this weight, the burden of our anger and pain. Teach us how to keep you close as you keep us close. Ease our burdens, stir in us the desire to remain connected to you and one another here as we receive your grace in this sacred time and space. Amen. I invite our young disciples to join me if you'd like or where you're seated, either it works. So this morning, we're talking about forgiveness, and that is hard to do, isn't it? So I want to tell you a story, because a lot of times when somebody hurts us, I don't know if any of you have ever been hurt, 
um, maybe by words or actions or things that happen, but sometimes it's kind of like a weighing, a scale back and forth, right? And, and there's this saying out in the world that says, get even, right? And so like if somebody's hurt you and you're weighed down with that hurt, that somebody else might want to, that the, that the world's telling us, well, fight back with them, get, get, get even, right? So I want to talk to you because, I want to tell you a story because I don't know that that's what Jesus wants us to do. So uh, there was this, um, these two brothers and they had farms right next to each other. And they, they had a great time growing up. They played together, they had fun together. They got these two farms. They were excited to share farming ideas and new equipment and things like that. And something happened. Somebody said something to someone else. And when that happened, all of a sudden, they both got offended, and they never talked to each other again. Okay? That happens, right? Happens in all of our relationships. Somewhere along the line, we get hurt. And so, one day, a carpenter was walking along, knocked on the door of one of the brothers, and said, Hey, I I'm looking for work. Do you have any work for me? And the brother said, As a matter of fact, I do. He takes him down to the edge of his property and he says, can you build a fence along here? The guy says, I can build anything, sure. And so he starts to put a fence up. But he does, the, the brother goes back into his house and the carpenter decides, instead of taking the wood that is the same for a fence, he takes that wood and he makes a bridge from one part of the property to another. And as the brother comes back to see his work and he starts to say something, the other brother's walking his field and walks over and says, oh my gosh, all the things that we've done to each other and you chose to still build a bridge. And before he could say anything, the brother runs, the brother from the other side runs over and gives him a hug. And suddenly, the bridge is at work, right? Um, that's the carpenter in Jesus is inviting us to build bridges and not fences and not something that will separate us and them, but rather how do we connect? We may have differences, but Jesus is teaching all of us to learn to build bridges to connect us, even to connect our differences so that we can learn and grow and be in relationship with one another. And when we do that, we're in relationship with God. And that's what we're called to be. And so I want to invite you to think about and pray and ask God, how can I build bridges? How can I connect with somebody rather than get even and fight back and get back? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So will you pray with me? When we pray as young disciples, growing in our faith, I'll say a line and I invite you to say that line after me. Let us pray. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Who helps us remember. Who helps us remember. To build bridges. To build bridges. And not fences. And not fences. Help us. Help us. Show love. Love. And not hatred. And not hatred. Help, us Help us to, to, show, to show love to all your children, to all your children. And, not anger. and not anger. Amen. 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 Let us center ourselves. <laughs> This morning, we turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 22. Hear now these words. If your brother or sister sins against you, 
Go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If you are listened to, then you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If that person refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if the offender refuses to listen to even the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For, there, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if my brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. May God bless our reading, hearing, and understanding. Thanks be to God. Friends, will you pray with me? Faithful God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be mingled with your spirit, that in these moments you might draw us to remember your will for our lives in relationship with you and one another. Amen. The past three weeks, we have come to explore some well-known common cliches that we might all have been prone to saying from time to time. They sound vaguely scriptural, and they possess some homespun kind of wisdom. That, so we assume that they are true. Things like God will never give you more than you can handle, right? Everything happens for a reason. But we have learned that the Bible does not say any of these. The reality is there are times when it would be best if we didn't either, my friends. A friend is devastated by a sudden and serious diagnosis. Or a colleague at work is devastated by a sudden or major depression or your next door neighbor is at the very end of their rope with their very troubled child. In these moments, we all want to be helpful, don't we? We want to offer something hopeful, something that feels faithful, and so we reach for one of these quasi-scriptural, almost spiritual platitudes to try to make things better when we're searching, when there's silence. We search for things like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. In that moment, at least one or two things happen. Either you wish you had never said it, or the other wishes they never heard it, right? Sometimes in our sincere efforts to want to be so helpful, in our earnest efforts to want to be faithful, we get it wrong and we make something worse. Including today's phrase, forgive and forget. I'm not trying to deconstruct your theology by any means with challenging these phrases, but I am trying to help us all see what we are actually saying about the nature of God, the character of God, when we say these cliches. And I'm also here to tell you the Bible never said them. Forgive and forget does sound a lot, though, like Matthew 18 that Joe just read to us. We know here that Peter is exasperated. Have you ever been there? He is frustrated. 
been there? Yeah. Somebody in the community, somebody in the group of Jesus followers had done it again. We don't know exactly what they've done, but whatever they've done, they've blown it, okay? And, and maybe, maybe this person has hurt somebody. Maybe he or she has said something they should have never said. No, we've never done that, right? Maybe they dropped the ball and everybody was waiting for them to, to follow through on their responsibility. Maybe he betrayed a trust or a confidence. Maybe he stabbed someone in the back with rumors or gossip. We don't really know what it is when we get to this point in scripture, but what we do know is Peter is, he's had it. And he comes to Jesus and he pulls him aside and he says, okay, when is enough enough? Jesus has just gone through this explanation of how you address something with someone, right? And he says, when is enough enough? How many times are we gonna let this guy off the hook? How many of us have thought of that, right? How many times do we forgive? Is it seven times? Is that enough? And Jesus responds, no, not seven times, 77. Forgiving the same jerk 77 times, if that's not outrageous enough, there are some interpreters of this passage who look at the original Greek and say, no, we got it wrong. What Jesus actually said was 70 times seven. So if you've heard either one of those, it's probably right. So in that case, you're not good at math because what Jesus is saying, we need to forgive this jerk, Peter, 490 times. Are you okay with that? I don't think Peter would have been. In other words, Jesus is saying, there are no limits to forgiveness. Stop counting. Don't do the math. Just get on with the business of forgiveness. When some of us hear this passage, we think it sounds like forgive and forget. In other words, forget, forgive and move on. But sometimes we wonder, how can we forget that thing? And if we can't forget that thing that's been done to us, how am I ever going to be able to forgive this person and move on? There are some kinds of traumas in all of our lives. Maybe it's a childhood trauma. Maybe it's a betrayal of a marriage or a relationship. Maybe it's a physical act of violence or an assault on you. Maybe it was a very public and humiliating slight. Maybe it was senseless preventable, unnecessary tra tragedy. And, but whatever it was, it hurt you deeply. And the pain is still there. It's a scar you feel every day or very often. You can almost see it, relive it. And you think to yourself, I'll never be the same because of this thing that happened to me. Because of what one person did to disrupt my life. You believe your life will never be the same. You think, how can I ever forget this, let alone forgive it? The truth is that there is no biblical basis to the concept of forgive and forget. I did my research this week and found out that it seems to have come from the hand of William Shakespeare. So King Lear says, if you might recall, if you've ever listened to Shakespeare or read Shakespeare, pray you now, forgive and forget. This must have been some kind of colloquialism because at the very same time in history, around the 15th, 16th centuries, another great writer named Miguel Cabarrus, um, I didn't say that right, Chevrons, uh, 
wrote a wonderful book, The Man of La Mancha, Don Quixote. Right? Don Quixote says to his poor friend Sancho, let us forget and forgive injuries. Hmm. Forgive and forget. Friends, it's not a biblical mandate. The heart of Christianity does not say forgive and forget, but it does say forgive. It is imperative in our, the heart of Christianity that we forgive our enemies and we forgive those who hurt us and who have sinned against us. This command to forgive makes Christianity unique from all other major world religions. There are some religions that subscribe to this idea of the law of retribution. The Alexia Talanos, the eye for the eye, you've heard of it. There are other traditions, religious traditions, that subscribe to this idea of karma, right? You've heard that. What goes around comes around. Also said eventually, the perpetrator will get what is due them. Eastern religions subscribe to the idea of emotional detachment. That is to subjugate the human impulses, especially the impulse to strike back and settle the score. Then along comes Jesus, who introduces this counter-cultural idea, counter-intuitive idea. It is a big idea of Jesus that is introduced. And that is forgiveness. One of the core tenets of our Christian faith. So what is forgiveness? Actually, what is it? Forgiveness is love's disruption of the consequences of our actions. Let me say that again. Forgiveness is love's disruption of the consequences of the actions. Forgiveness is unnatural, my friends. We all know that forgiveness is fraught with all kinds of risks and even dangers. Am I right? Set aside for a moment to, to think about your personal grievances or what you've experienced. All your in, iniquities over the years. And ask the question, what about the big stuff? So if we have all these own inequities, transgressions that we have and we hold on to, and we put them aside a moment and we think about, what about the really big stuff? Like mass shootings. What about hurt that happens because of just an evil spirit? What about those? Our, cultural, our culture would say, that the only way to defeat and combat evil is to fight back with justice and force. Am I right? In other words, we combat evil by ensuring that people get what they deserve. That justice is served, and that's how we understand justice. An eye for an eye, the fairness in our society is known by retaliation. This is how we keep our books balanced, right? It's how we want to live, to know if you do this mistake, you're going to have a, a significant consequence, and we can get back at you for it. There are times in my life when someone has hurt me, and I think to myself, I am completely justified in fighting back and inflicting some of the similar pain that they have inflicted on me. I may think to myself, if it doesn't settle the score, or at least it'll help me feel better, right? 
But what we find out is retaliation doesn't help us feel better. Here's the problem. I choose when I've been hurt so often not to fight back. Not because I'm a good person, but because I think if I just walk away, if I walk away, I will carry, I, I can let it go. But the problem is you don't, do you? When you walk away, you carry on the pain. You, care, you get weighed down by the heartache. And then in a few days or even of weeks or months or years of your life, you are still carrying and emulating that pain. So here's the truth. When we don't strike back, it's not going to make us feel better. We can't just forget. Because when we do that, it takes injury on ourselves. And it makes us feel worse. When we carry it around, when we hold on to the injuries and the hurts, we end up harming other people, often the very people we love most in life. When we don't fight back, we are inflicted with the pain. Am I right? Maybe it is like this for you, carrying around wounds and, and, and injuries like rocks, wherever we go. You wake up in the morning, you put your feet on the ground from your bed, and you pick up your rock, that weight that's weighing on you. Maybe it's a tr trauma, maybe it's words, maybe it's action. You pick them up, you walk down the stairs, you go out to the garage, you put the rock in the front seat, you buckle it in, you drive to work, you hold that rock at your desk in the boardroom, you carry it into all the offices, into all your conversations. And at the end of the day, you pick up your rack, you carry it back to the car, you buckle it back in, you bring it back home, it's on the dinner table, it's in the family room. You're not proud of it, but you take comfort in knowing that your rock is there, that you haven't let go of the pain that is great. We take our rocks everywhere, on vacations, on business trips, to the gym, and even to our kids' soccer fields. We take it everywhere because it's my rock. It happened to me, and I'm going to hold on to it, right? There are people that carry the rock around their entire lives, my friends. And maybe that's how you're feeling. Maybe you're in that experience, and you cannot drop it. It's a heavy burden to carry, but it's ours. It's part of our story. It begins to affect everything we do, conversations, relationships, waking up and going to bed. We begin, we begin to embody life with our wrong. And we begin to transmit that pain. Richard Rohr, a theologian, current day, reminds us that you can tell a lot about a person with what they do with their pain. Do they transform it? Do they transmit it? Or do they say, yes, this happened to me, but this will stop. This will not end here. Jesus, in this scripture today, gives us a prescription on how to defeat and conquer sin and injustice. And it is to forgive. It is not vengeance. It is not retaliation. It is not anger and resentment. It's not carrying the rock around. It's forgiveness, folks. Love's disruption of the consequences of one's actions. This offends our human impulses for justice and fairness. This is the God we encounter, though, on the cross. On the cross, we see what it looks like when the world throws everything at one human being injustice, scapegoating, hatred, whenever the world does that, it plays with the very real and predictable ways. It always ends with the suffering of God. Always. And it sometimes plays with bloodshed. Sometimes it plays with humiliation and agony and loneliness and disillusionment. But before it's all over on the cross, God flips the narrative 
and in that moment offers forgiveness. God, through Jesus Christ, doesn't lift a finger to the oppressors in judgment or in violence, but instead says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In that moment, the rock is dropped for all of us. And God says, go and do likewise. Help us drop our rocks and free us from them. This is the suggestion of the commandment, a commandment which God says to everyone, if it takes seven times, 70 times to forgive, do it. Jesus gives us step-by-step instructions, my friends, about go and forgiving in Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, go and point out the fault just between the two of you. If he doesn't listen, go with a friend and meet them again. If he still doesn't listen, get the community, get the church, get the whole group together. The aim of forgiveness is restoration. So Jesus is saying the aim is the restoration of the offender, restoration to the community, always pulling the community back together. Friends, when we do that, our own self-perception, our own saintliness, our own judgment of others as being less than us, is adjusted. When we restore, when there is restoration to community, we affirm that none of us is worse than the worst thing we've ever done. None of us are saintlier than the best thing we've ever done. It's not forgive and forget. It's forgive and remember, my friends. That's the biblical statement. Remember God's grace for you whenever you least deserve it. Remember. This is to be remembered in the community of faith. Remember the family of grace. God's grace lived out in community. Bruce Models, a Lutheran pastor, and he wrote in a book this story. He talked about a man who came to church several Sundays, but he slipped in at the end, right? We all know this sometimes, right? You slip in at the end, you sit at the Bach pew, and before we get through the benediction and, and the clergy can get down the aisle, they, he slipped out, right? That happens. And he kept slipping out till one day he waited and he introduced himself as Dan. In the later months, he told Modell, the pastor, that he had walked out on his wife more than 20 years, of more than 20 years. And he also walked out on his two daughters, one in high school and one that was finishing her college career. His older daughter was planning her wedding and she had called him. She said she wanted him to walk her down the aisle. She wanted him to return to the family. So that brought back an idea to him that he should go and see and feel what it's like to be in church again. To the church that they had belonged to for so long. And he didn't know if he could face it. But he wanted to picture the church and, and the wedding in the church where this family had come together for so long. So he came to church and he sat on the back pew for the songs and the prayers, the words and the sermons, and he resonated and he reflected and he was reminded that he needed to be there. So he came to church. And in one of the conversations he had with Modell, the pastor, he says, now what do I do? What's next? And he reported that by his daughter reaching out, she connected him to his wife as well for conversations. And in those conversations, Don's wife said, come home, just come home. And he said that effect it had on him shifted him. 
the kindness of his daughter, the grace of his wife, led him to look at his life. And as I said, return to church. It asked, invited him to begin to reflect on who was the person he wanted to be. And he was not happy with what he had become. It was that disgust of himself that the Holy Spirit used to bring him back to church. And in these conversations, he again returned to Pastor Modell saying, what's next? And Modell says, are you ready to be forgiven? Are you ready to be forgiven? Sometimes we need to do that to ourselves, right? And so together they walked up to the baptismal font after church one day and they turned to Psalm 51, which we partly recited in our call to worship. 51 was King David's psalm after the Bathsheba incident and, and David had everything to confess, right? And he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses, wash me through and through. And so there at the baptismal font, Modell puts his hands on Don's head and he baptizes him. They stood looking at each other when Don asked, what do I do now? What do I do next? That was Don's constant question that through this whole journey of months. And Modell says, go home. Your wife has invited you to go home. And you are forgiven. Don's story is unique. And I'm not saying it's everybody's story. But the part of Don's story that stands with me is that he then stood and walked down the aisle with his daughter. And as is customary, right, as is dads all over, get tears as they walk their daughter down the aisle. But in Don's case, as soon as his daughter walked up and put her, his, her, arm, through, her arm through his, he bawled. He bawled. Because he remembered that he is forgiven. He remembered and he was remembered into the community of faith in New Orleans. My friends, the scripture doesn't end there. It doesn't tell us to forgive and forget. It tells us to forgive and remember or remember and forgive. And when we do, when we remember, we also remember that we are called to go and do likewise. Amen. Will you pray with me? Here we are again, merciful God, carrying into this time of prayer and this place of joy and freedom all our burdens that weigh us down. Here we come with all the scores we long to settle, the justice we want to demand for the wrongs we have suffered, the greeds and betrayals we can no longer stand for. So Lord, in this time of prayer, help us remember. Help us remember and reflect. Lead us from these behaviors and thoughts and attitudes and actions that express that we are better than another and that we deserve retaliation to be played on another. Lead us into that reflection. Comfort and heal our wounds as we offer forgiveness as we reflect and remember the forgiveness we have received, forgiveness undeserved, forgiveness freely given, forgiveness that reunites us. You call us deeply to love one another, to put the needs and interests of others above and before us, especially in this time of prayer. Teach us, Lord, to love you as deeply as you have loved us. You call us to deal honorably with others, even those who have offended us. 
Show us how to work through our disagreements and live life with integrity so we might build up your family, the body of Christ. So we bring to you now the prayers for ourselves, our brothers and our sisters here now in our prayers. Hear us, Lord. Julie. Corinna. May this conversation with you lead us to a place of forgiving peace, a place where our hunger for grace and mercy is filled, a place where we are freed from anger, vengeance, and retaliation as we pray together. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite our ushers to come forward to receive our gifts that we may be agents of hope and forgiveness in the community. And I invite our Sunday school teachers and children to make their way to uh, the Sunday school classroom. dedication for a gift.
doesn't take away from the consequences, but it shows love in the midst of them. And so as we go out into the world, may we be sustained and sustain the world with a word of hope. May we draw strangers into the refuge of grace. And may we bear the love of Christ in every place, in all times, and for all God's people. Amen.